My name is Jane Jonas and I'm a research scholar at Colorado State University. So going way back, as a small child sitting with my grandmother in her garden, I remember watching ants and trying to figure out what, you know, what are they doing? They were doing something and it was fascinating to me and um, I was fascinated with it all the way up through college and then um, in ecology courses figuring out that it was really fun and doing ecological work and thinking about um, the role of insects in the environment is, um, is meaningful too. So that, that was really what first drew me. Um, to the field. Well, one of the themes that kind of goes through all of my work is thinking about reciprocal interactions. So whenever we have, say, plants and insects interacting with one another, it's an interaction that goes both ways. So plants are impacting insects and insects are impacting plants and thinking about how those interactions that are happening at the same time work is really fascinating to me. I don't think there's one most rewarding moment of my career so far, I'd say it's every time, um, you know, in a project, sometimes you'll get stuck or things won't make sense, and you kind of have to wrestle with it in that moment when it all comes together and the puzzle starts taking shape and you can start seeing what the meaning um, is. That's, those are the rewarding moments every time. That, those are my favorite things. Those are what keep me interested and excited about doing what I'm doing. Hey guys, thanks for coming to the uh, FRS seminar today. Um, my name is Ryan Schroeder. I'm a second year master's student here in the graduate degree program in ecology, but I think my home more here in the Forest and Rangeland Stewardship Department and the Restoration Ecology Lab. But today I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Jane Jonas, who will be talking to us about those other herbivores that we don't often think about in rangeland systems, and usually that we try to, whenever we're out doing sampling, we kind of cuss at, uh, but uh, those are grasshoppers, and so Jane's gonna be talking about the importance of their diversity in uh, rangeland systems. Um, a little bit of background about Jane. Uh, she's a research scholar and an instructor here in the Forest and Rangeland Stewardship Department. Um, her research mainly focuses broadly on restoration and grassland ecology, uh, with particular interests in plant-insect interactions and ecological statistics, and she's really good at that statistics part. Um, she earned her graduate degree in biology and entomology from Kansas State University, and her undergraduate degree in life sciences at Wayne State in Nebraska. Um, I've had the distinct pleasure to work with her for the past about two years and uh, taken a number of her classes including Ecology of Grasslands and Shrublands and also the Rangeland Sampling Course which are both have been some of my favorite classes here at CSU. She's helped me grow a lot as a writer and a thinker and helped me a lot with those stats questions. Um, so please help me in welcoming Jane Jonas. Thank you Ryan. So yeah, so we're going to talk about um, the small herbivores today, but before I get going, I just want to um, you know, make sure to acknowledge that uh, all of the work I'm going to talk about today is the product of um, intense collaboration um, at multiple institutions. Um, and so, and funding source funding has come from a, a wide variety of sources as well. So I just want to make sure to acknowledge that everything I'm talking about, it was the team effort, not just me um, by any stretch of the imagination. But the kind of underlying theory behind the work I'm going to talk about is the idea that um, increasing biodiversity helps promote ecosystem function. So this biodiversity ecosystem function or BEF relationships. And we see in a lot of studies that look at plants, because plants are usually the, the organism that gets manip manipulated in these types of experiments or, or research for these questions. And when we manipulate plant diversity, um, a whole variety of long-term experiments have shown beneficial um, uh, responses. So primary productivity increases, we see increased decomposition rates, soil carbon storage increases, better pollination services, and the plant community becomes more resistant to invasion. All right. Before I go on any further though, there's just a little bit of terminology I want to clarify, and that is the difference between the terms species diversity and species richness. So species diversity is kind of a broadly used term that refers to the number of species and often also takes into account their relative abundances. So species diversity tech, in a technical sense is that, that mix of not only how many species but how abundant are they. Species richness is just the number of species. Okay, so you'll see in a lot of the stuff I'm going to show 
you'll see number of species or number of or number of species or plant richness. Those are the same things. How many plant species were in the community or in the experiment? So in terms of thinking beyond just the plant community, we also know studies have shown that as you increase plant richness, you generally see an increase in herbivore richness as well. Um, kind of makes sense. You have a lot more different kinds of food, so you can support a lot more different kinds of consumers. Um, and so, so here's just a couple different examples from some of the long-term experiments like at Cedar Creek and in Germany. The other thing we know is that herbivory can have strong impacts on plant community structure and function. So this is just an example of a grazing exposure. Cattle were kept out. We see much higher uh, biomass in the exposure than where cattle were grazing. So herbivory has these really large impacts on ecosystems as well. All right. Which brings us to grasshoppers. So it's very easy to see the impact of ungulate grazers, cattle, bison, those sorts of organisms on ecosystems. The, the herbivores that it's harder to appreciate their impact are the small invertebrate herbivores, and in particular grasshoppers. In rangelands, grasshoppers are, the dominant, are one of the do most dominant insect herbivores, and it's been estimated that they can consume in an average year somewhere between 5 and 15 percent of annual net primary productivity. But on top of that, they're super inefficient feeders. So when they break, when they're feeding, they'll break off an entire leaf but only eat a small part of it. And the rest of that becomes part of the, the litter layer. So if we think about the fact that they're only taking, in, that they're taking in 5 to 15 percent of annual net primary productivity, plus they're wasting one to three times more than that. That's a huge amount of productivity that is being consumed and recycled by these small herbivores. It's just that it's distributed so much more differently, differently on the landscape that it's harder to notice. In the western U.S., there are about 400 species of grasshoppers, although only about 70 are frequently encountered. Most of them are just kind of rare. You see them here and there, but, but not super common. Twelve of the species are considered economic pests because during, they can form outbreaks, they can get really high densities, do a lot of um, you know, what we'd consider economic damage to, to crops and range. Um, but we also know that they perform a lot of really important ecological roles. They have a really important role in nutrient cycling, again, because they're feeding on such small scales. Things are, are um, cycling through the system at a faster rate, typically. Um, and then they are also an important prey so resource for birds and some small mammals. Okay. The other important thing about grasshoppers, especially when we're talking about biodiversity and richness relationships, is that a grasshopper isn't just a grasshopper. Each species has feeding preferences. And to a certain extent, those preferences are morphologically defined or limited. So we have four feeders who have a distinct, these are mandib grasshopper mandibles. Four mandibles have ridges that are really good at getting nutrients out of the cells of forbs. Grass feeders have much different mandible morphology because those are much better at getting um, through the tough cell wall of grass tissues. And then mixed feeders have morphology that's somewhere in between. And these species are really interesting because they tend to feed mostly on forbs, but they need to have grasses in their diets to be successful as well. Okay, so mostly feeding on forbs, but they need grasses to um, reproduce. All right. Within each of these three broad categories, host specificity can vary widely. So you can have really you know, species, one plant species is their only food resource to, you know, any forb species will do. Uh, the nutritional needs also vary widely among species, and they're very good at testing out plant tissues and deciding what they're going to eat based on the nutritional quality of that tissue. Um, and just kind of another generality about um, rangeland grasshoppers is that in most sites, grass feeders, most sites in most years, grass feeders are going to be the dominant feeding guild that's present. Okay. 
mixed feeders can outbreak, so some years you'll see mixed feeders kind of um, become a really important part of the community. Most of the part, for the most part though, grass feeders are the dominant group. All right. So what do we see when we look at relationships between plant species richness and grasshopper species richness? Sometimes we see a positive response like we might expect. So this is a study from Kansa Prairie. Plant species richness increases, we get more grasshopper species. But there are a lot of other sites and a lot of other studies that fail to find any relationship at all. all right. But if we think about the fact that there are these feeding guilds, um, you know, it may, may suggest that we really need to think about the functional relationships. So maybe it's not species diversity, maybe it's functional diversity that's more important in how grasshopper um, diversity relates to plant diversity. All right. And because there are so many species specific um, factors like nutritional needs and their feeding preferences, you know, maybe we need to think about species specific responses as well. And the other thing, I just wanted to uh, share this quote. So I love reading really old scientific articles, and this is one of my favorites. It's from 1936, so kind of the height of the Dust Bowl, central Kansas. And this person went out, actually it was northeast Kansas. Um, but anyway, went out and surveys, surveyed a bunch of different areas. And he says, in native prairie, we find a number of species, grasshopper species, which in the cultivated areas are rare, all right? So this is our first clue that already there, you know, he was noticing that more species native prairie, we have a more diverse grasshopper community. And then he goes on to say, not only were the notorious species conspicuously scarce, but the injury by those which were present was of little consequence. Ecosystem impacts, all right? So the native prairie, we've got a more diverse assemblage, and it's likely they're not having as big of an impact on plant productivity as they are in cultivated areas. Okay, so this paper, he was comparing crop fields to native prairies. There are some other papers where they were um, comparing planted pasture to native prairies, and it's much the same relationship. The native prairie generally had more diversity and less um, damage from grasshoppers despite even, you know, through the Dust Bowl, the Dust Bowl era. All right. So, you know, here we are <clears throat> 80 some years later and we're still trying to figure out, well, how, what are these relationships? How are grasshopper diversity and ecosystem function really related? Um, and so that's what I'm gonna kind of focus on for the rest of the talk. And to kind of set up kind of my frame of mind and how I look at this, here's just a very general conceptual model of how grasshoppers fit into a grassland ecosystem. So we've got our three primary drivers of grassland system function, fire, grazing, and weather. Uh, these three drivers can influence plant dynamics. All right. um, and then it's the grasshoppers can respond to changes in the plants. All right, so we can have changes in plant composition, the structure of the plant community, and nutritional quality. All of those things can influence the grasshoppers. We also have the possibility that weather can directly impact grasshoppers because grasshoppers, being insects, can't thermoregulate. Um, you know, their, their egg production, everything about their life cycle can be impacted by different weather, um, changes in weather. The other thing that we need to think about is the fact that there may be some sort of density dependent mechanisms that are involved in regulating grasshopper communities. So this is kind of just the general overview of where grasshoppers can fit into the larger ecosystem, grassland ecosystem. Okay. So setting up with that, where I'm going is the first part I'm gonna think of, I wanna think about you know, those three main controllers, fire, grazing, and weather. How do those influence grasshopper diversity? And then, so we're gonna look at that for a little bit and then at the, for the last part of the talk, we're gonna look at how grasshopper diversity can then impact ecosystem function. So we're gonna kinda look at the two sides of the coin, how ecosystem drivers influence grasshoppers, how grasshoppers can influence an ecosystem. 
All right. So for this first part, I'm going to talk about some work I did using long-term data sets of grasshopper populations and communities from Kansas Prairie in Kansas and Arapaho Prairie in the Sand Hills of Nebraska. These two data sets overlap quite a lot, but the sampling techniques that were used are very different, so they had to be analyzed in very different ways. Um, but those are the two data sets. Also notice, so Arapaho Prairie is farther, quite a bit farther west than Kanza, which is going to be important in a little bit. All right, so using these two long-term data sets, we look, can look at influences of weather over the long term. Um, at Kanza, we can also assess the effects of management, and then we can look at density dependence effect, effects as well. All right, so this is an example from Arapaho Prairie, the Nebraska site. But this is a, something that we commonly see in western grasshopper populations, is this kind of these cycles. So if we've got density over time, this is the whole, gra all grasshoppers together, we see these pretty regular 10 to 15 year intervals of high and low densities. All right, so the question then becomes, well, what, why? But it's not so simple because if we break it down and we look at what's happening, so these lines, the colored lines down here are all represent the different species that make up that community. And you can see that each species is cycling, but cycling in a different way. Okay, they're not all in sync with one another. All right. And to a certain extent, if, we would, if I broke it out by feeding guild, we would see some patterns with feeding guilds. So grasshoppers tend to be high, and then when they go low, that's when the mixed feeders become more dominant. So we see kind of these um, regular patterns, but they're offset a little bit. And the, the general uh, prevailing wisdom is that it's usually associated with drought, that these population cycles are associated with drought. Okay. And the other point to make here is that, so even if we're managing to promote grasshopper diversity, these cycles can kind of override that to a certain extent. So in these analyses for both data sets, I included our, our usual set of local variables like precipitation and temperature in the growing season and the dormant season. But one of the things with the, I was particularly interested in with these data sets was to look at the, these ocean land teleconnections. So things like the Southern Oscillation in, Index or the El Nino cycles that you may have heard about. Um, these are large scale things. They're centered over the oceans. So we've got the Southern Pacific is the center for the El Nino, Pacific Decadal is kind of the Northern Pacific, and then the North Atlantic Oscillation. So these are large atmospheric phenomena that happen you know, on either, in either ocean. And they also, like grasshoppers, they have these cycles. So this is the, the Southern Oscillation Index, and it tends to have like a five to 10 year cycle of going into this negative phase and positive phase. Um, and these changes in phase can actually impact weather here in, in, you know, throughout the U.S. in different ways. Okay, so we know these oscillations can have impacts on weather throughout the, the U.S. We know they cycle much like grasshopper populations. So I wanted to look at if there's any relationship between how these, you know, uh, these teleconnections cycle in the responses in grasshoppers. So in the Arapaho Prairie, data set, here we've got population growth rate. So the dotted line represents no change in population. Dots above represent increasing populations and below uh, periods of decreasing population sizes. All right. And what we found was that for mixed feeders, when the Pacific Decadal Oscillation is in its positive phase, we see a decline in uh, mixed feeder population growth rates. So PDA goes in, PDO goes into a negative or a positive phase, and mixed feeder populations begin begin to decline. All right, so that's pretty cool. And why might that be? So if we look at so this is a map. These are maps um, of how the Pacific Decadal Oscillation impacts precipitation, and then this is minimum temperatures during the winter. So this is winter precipitation, winter minimum temperatures in response to changes in the PDO. All right, so for where the Sand Hill site is, for where Arapaho Prairie is, 
we see a signal of having a wetter winter and a warmer, so minimum temperatures don't go as low during that positive phase of the PDO. So this is really cool because a lot of mixed feeders have to go through diapause in the winter in order for their eggs to complete development. So what this may be telling us is that during this positive phase of the PDO, mixed feeding populations start to decline because there's a high egg mortality during the winter, potentially. Of course, with this analysis, we can't look at me mechanisms, but that's you know, one of the likely scenarios. Okay, so that's Arapahoe Prairie. So at Kanza, at Kanza, um, let me go back one. So Kanza is right about here. So there really aren't very strong impacts of PDO at Kanza, not like there are in the, in the sand hills. So in our analysis of Kanza, rather than the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, here mixed feeders were declining during the positive phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation. All right. And then here's mixed feeders tended to increase during that time. So we get this sort of divergent response between forb feeders and mixed feeders during this positive phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation. And again, um, these maps aren't as easy to look at because they're a larger scale. But so here are the impacts. This is temperature up on top, precipitation on the bottom. We've got wintertime impacts and springtime impacts. All right, so again, kind of like what we saw for effects of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation at um, Arapaho, in, at Kanza, again, we're seeing this positive phase of the uh, North Atlantic Oscillation impacting winter weather. Again, we're having warmer winters, and then the spring following that warm winter is warm and dry. Okay, so much like the, the temperature or the uh, weather impacts of of we saw at Arapahoe. Okay, so you can kind of see, trying to point out the little spots where Kanza would be. All right. All right. So that's weather. So in both both um, sites, we see a relationship with the teleconnections, and the, the relationship, the weather variables affected by those teleconnections are somewhat similar at the two different sites. So that's pretty cool, and that kind of tells us that that large abiotic influence of weather, um, uh, we can pick up that signal in kind of these other, other ways. So at Kanza, we were also able to look at the effects of management. So Kanza is split up into watershed, experimental watersheds where different fire and grazing um, treatments are implemented. And most of the grazed watersheds are grazed by bison. They do have some cattle sites, but um, this is all data from bison grazing um, locations. All right, so we did, um, this is an ordination analysis. So if you're not familiar with looking at these, this dot basically represents, encapsulates the community, the unique species and their relative abundance of a given community at a given site. So where we have two dots close together, that means their community was very similar and points farther apart, communities were very different. All right. <clears throat> the other thing, so these numbers by the points represent the fire treatments. So the first number is the fire return interval. So the four means it's burned once every four years. Okay, we also have um, watersheds burned once a year, once every 20 years, and once every two years. And then the number in parentheses indicates how many years it's been since the last fire. So zero means it was burned that earlier that spring before data were, the hoppers were collected. You know, 14 had been 14 years since the last burn, and so on. So in this analysis, we didn't really see any patterns associated with burning, whether it was fire return interval or the time since the last fire. But what we did find is a really strong signal associated with bison grazing. And what we see is that where the bison grazing pastures had much higher grasshopper diversity than those that were not grazed. Okay. So again, our management can also influence diversity of our grasshopper populations or communities. Okay. 
And then the last thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of controls on grasshopper diversity is looking at the, the uh, role of density dependence. So biotic regulation of grasshopper populations, whether that's through competition or predation or whatever. Um, so this is for Kanza. This dotted line would represent no change in population size from one year to the next. The red dots up here, although that's the grass feeding portion of the community. We've got the forb feeding portion and the mixed feeding portion of the community. And what we see is that if we look, so we've got plotted, this is frequency in uh, one year plotted against the frequency of the next year. So it's kind of change in population over time. So if the population would be completely unregulated, no biotic, no density dependence, we would expect the dots to kind of be all over the place. And perfect density dependence, um, we would expect to be on the straight line. So what we see is that there's a sort of cycling with all three of our feeding guilds, they kind of cycle around that change of stability. So that gives us really good indication that there's some role of, of density dependence also at play in, in um, regulating these communities. Right, so that's Kanza at Arapaho Prairie. Um, here we were looking at, we looked at it a little bit differently because of the kind of data we had. So here we've got density on the X and growth, population growth rate on the, the Y. So what this is showing us is that when population, the larger the population, the growth rate starts to decline. So as we get big populations, they start growing, start to decline. And then when population sizes get low, then they start to increase going forward after that. Okay. So again, this negative relationship um, indicates density dependence. All right. All right. <clears throat> so our long-term controls <clears throat> on grasshopper populations in terms of management, just to, to recap here, grazing can promote diversity. Weather can have uh, impacts, um, mostly a lot uh, in terms of shifts with functional composition, and it could be through direct or indirect effects. And then we also saw um, a signal for density dependence at play, um, but whether that's, you know, there could be a lot of different things that control um, populations through density dependence. Okay. So there's all of these things that are kind of coming into play in determining kind of the composition and diversity of our grasshopper populations. So what does that mean for the impacts grasshopper populations have on ecosystem function, particularly when we're thinking about diversity? So the first thing I'm going to talk about is um, some general plant gra grasshopper relationships across kind of a large um, spatial scale. And then I'll take a, a little bit of a look at um, an experiment we did in, in Houston. All right. So just to preface where the, 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 um, the, the setup for this um, work was a pilot study that was done by some of um, the collaborators on um, my other, the other work is Angela Laws and Chelsea Prather and Dave Franson and Michael Strickland did this um, kind of small pilot study at three sites, one in Montana, Kansas, and Texas. And they were asking this question, well, is it species richness, you know, grasshopper species richness, grasshopper functional richness? Um, you know, how are these things impacting plant communities? And what they found was that the functional group identity of the community was much more important than either species richness or functional richness per se. All right, it didn't really matter if you had two or three functional groups present, it mattered whether those functional groups were grass feeders or mixed feeders or a little bit of both. Okay. All right, and so what this is just showing then is that a change in biomass compared to control, grass feeders had a, caused a significant, well all three were st statistically significant declines in plant biomass, but the largest decline in bio plant biomass was associated with grass feeders. All right. <clears throat> so after they finished that pilot study, we started talking about other follow-up experiments that might help kind of fill out the picture of what's going on. 
So the first thing we did was we set up this latitudinal gradient. So each of the little yellow pins. And at each of these sites, we sampled grasshopper communities and plant communities, just kind of fairly generally, um, because we just wanted to get an idea of how closely related grasshopper functional and species richness was with plant richness and diversity. All right. Because you know the nature of the latitudinal gradient weather varied quite a lot from Houston up to Montana, so we used um, a weather covariate to kind of control for the different weather conditions the different sites experienced. And we looked at a variety of different plant responses. We looked at forb and grass quality, so percent nitrogen and carbon to nitrogen ratios. We looked at biomass, total biomass grass forbs and um, richness. And what we found was not, lot, not a lot, <laughs> which given the scale of the project isn't too surprising. We only had seven sites. Um, that's not a lot. A lot of variability can come into play when we, you know, at the scale. What we did find was in terms of for biomass, so if we look at grass feeder, the richness of grass feeders, and this is presented as the proportion of grass feeding species in the community. So how many species out of the total were grass feeders? And what we see is that this orange line represents um, the effect of that grass feeder richness. Um, when grass feeders make up the, the majority of species in the community, uh, we see really low for biomass. Okay. But what was even a, a better fit was in terms, if we look at this in terms of the proportion of individuals of grass feeders, so grass feeder abundance. And the more of the community that, individuals in the community that are grass feeders, we really see really strong negative relationship um, with for biomass. Um, we can't really look at, we can't really assess cause and effect relationships, but it's possible it could work either way. It could be that this relation, these relationships are due to the fact that um, mixed feeders need forbs to complete their life cycle. So if you don't have forbs, you're not going to be able to support mixed feeders. And so you would expect then most of the community is going to be grass feeders. It's one possibility. The other possibility is that overall the year that we did the survey, grasshopper populations densities were low. So the other possibility is that um, as you have more grass, or as you have more grass feeding individuals in the community, at low density, their feeding could make a, a like kind of compensatory response. So a little bit of feeding can cause plants to grow more than they would otherwise. So this compensatory growth response. So that's possible as well. Is that a lot of grasshoppers, but there aren't or uh, mostly grass feeding grasshoppers, but there aren't a lot of them. So they're stimulating more grass growth than um, under nor normal conditions. So, um, you know, it's an interesting pattern. We can't really say cause and effect, but it's definitely um, something that uh, we want to kind of keep on our mind. All right, so general plant grasshopper relationships, not a lot there. Um, if we want to look at the next step was then to do a much more controlled experiment at a single location to ask much more specific questions about how grasshopper richness can impact ecosystem function. So this uh, was done by Houston. We had um, a nested treatment structure, so functional group richness. We had, you know, we had our control, so no grasshoppers at all. We had one group of uh, one functional group and one species, so we had just grass feeders, one species of grass feeders, one species of mixed feeder, and so this is, we, we were using two different species, so um, one set of, of plots had just grass feeding species one, one set of plots had just grass feeding species two. Here we had, you know, kind of likewise, one set of plots with just mixed feeding species one and mixed feeding species two was another set of plots. All right, so we had we also had a treatment with two, both of the species of either grass feeder or mixed feeder. So a set of plots that had both grass feeding species, a set of plots with both mixed feeding species. 
And then we had two functional groups present and in combinations with either two, three, or four species, and all species combinations of those four are four species, our two grass feeders and our two mixed feeders. All right, so we ended up with 148 cages in the field, and this is what the array looked like. Um, it was at the coastal center associated with the University of Houston, set up in a randomized complete block design, these cages, are a half a meter squared uh, area by a meter tall, and they're covered with lumite screen so that the grasshoppers can't really chew through it as easily, but it still lets a lot of light into the cage. Right. <clears throat> so this experiment was done in the summer of 2016, and here we looked at, again, a lot of responses, relative, ch um, uh, responses in terms of uh, grass, sorry, plant richness, plant cover, and biomass. All right, just to set you up with how to um, interpret these graphs, so again, we looked at relative change in richness over the course of the experiment. So the dotted line represents no change. If you see an asterisk, that means that from the beginning to the end of the experiment, there was a significant either decrease or increase in that particular response. All right. And so for richness, interestingly, and perhaps expectedly, what we saw was the only time we saw a significant decline in for richness was associated with treatments that only had mixed feeding species in them. Okay, so again, those mixed feeders are primarily feeding on forbs, and it was the forb richness that had a negative response to mixed feeders. All right. For grass richness, uh, there was really no nothing going on. Grass richness was unaffected by our grasshopper treatments. Okay. If we look at what happens in terms of biomass, you know, kind of the expectation, one of the expectations um, was that if we look at biomass in the control with no grasshoppers to biomass in any of the grasshopper treatments, we would expect that the biomass in the control would be highest and then the grasshopper treatments would be some version of lower than that. <clears throat> but what we found was that in several of the treatments, biomass was the same as the control. No, no real difference between our, the grasshopper treatment and the control. So that was a bit of a surprise. Where we did see the biggest decline in biomass was in our lowest diversity treatment. One species treatment had the most negative response in biomass. Okay. <clears throat> if we look at what happens in terms of the relative cover of forbs, um, here we've got a little bit more complicated uh, responses going on, but they're really interesting. So this is relative change in forb cover. And where we see, what we see is a significant increase in forb cover in the plots with grass feeders, which is surprising because we would have expected a negative, you know, what we would have expected is the mixed feeders who are feeding on forbs would have caused a decline in forb cover, but instead there was no change in forb cover with the, the mixed feeders, but there was a significant increase in forbs in cages with grass feeders. Okay, so that was kind of interesting. We also saw a significant increase in forb cover in the highest diversity treatment. Okay. <clears throat> and Similarly, kind of surprising result with grass cover. So grass cover um, didn't change a whole lot in the treatments with only grass feeders, but in the treatment with only mixed feeders, grass cover increased. So again, that was kind of opposite of what we would have expected to see. Um, so what might be, what might be going on? So it's likely that these responses of, you know, mixed feeders or grass feeders influencing forbs and mixed feeders influencing grasses uh, might be indication of an indirect effect on plant competition. All right. 
So as grass feeders are feeding on grasses, grasses become less competitive against forbs, leading to an increase in forbs, and vice versa. In plots with only mixed feeders, they feed on, on forbs, change competitive dynamics, and may um, kind of release grass competition a little bit as well. Okay, so that's pretty cool, um, cool response to see. All right, and the last thing we looked at was changes in, or uh, yeah, the effects of our richness and diversity treatments on uh, plant tissue quality. And we really didn't find a whole lot. Um, what we did find is, so this is, uh, we measured plant quality by looking at carbon and nitrogen ratios. And so the way we would interpret this is, you know, the higher the carbon to nitrogen ratio would be the lower quality food. So low, low carbon to nitrogen is the higher quality food. Um, so it was a little bit of a surprise to see that gener you know, our generally lowest quality food was in the highest diversity treatment, um, you know, kind of across all of the other, compared to all of the other treatments, especially the lower diversity treatments. So that was forb quality. Um, and again, there wasn't a lot going on in terms of changes in grass quality, although we do see that gra uh, grass quality was higher in the plots uh, with the mixed feeders. All right, so the plots where grasses weren't really being fed on to a great extent tended to have higher plant qu grass quality than um, all the other treatments. So again, not exactly what we would have expected, but a fairly interesting result nonetheless. Okay. So does grasshopper richness impact ecosystem function? Um, well, the evidence is pretty weak. Everything, um, the pilot study, the latitudinal study, and the, the field experiment all kind of point to richness per se not being as important as the functional group identity itself. Um, and then, you know, we, we had this interesting result where um, there's some indication that plant competition may be, um, may be altered in those low diversity treatments. Um, so if we have low functional diversity, um, we may see some changes or shifts in plant competition that, that cascade. Um, but the caveat here with all of this is that the experiment only ended up running for six weeks. We had and planned on it being the entire summer, um, but the field site partway into the experiment became infested with raspberry crazy ants, which are an invasive ant. They are voracious and they love grasshoppers. So throughout the experiment, we kept, um, the cages were checked frequently and restocked so that the density of grasshoppers in every cage was the same throughout the time um, of the experiment. Well, the raspberry crazy ants infested the site so bad that we ran out of grasshoppers to restock the cages with. So we, at that point, we just had to end the experiment. All right. So it's very short term. A lot of the biodiversity ecosystem function um, experiments are much longer and have shown that it take, can take multiple years for a lot of the ecosystem impacts to really um, manifest. So, um, you know, all of that's kind of the, the caveat on all of this is we didn't find a lot in terms of species or functional richness relationships with ecosystem function, but this is a very small, short snapshot at one location. Um, so eventually we would like to repeat the experiment at multiple sites to see um, if there are other kind of patterns that would emerge over time. Questions? I have one. So going to the quality, you're pretty much just measuring though whatever is left. And the grasshoppers might have already gotten whatever's because you said that they're very selective, right? And so, is there any potential like confounding? Like, what if they just have eaten all what's good that's there? So, yeah, they weren't. We didn't stock them at such high densities that they would have been food limited. So I think that by, um, you know, 
sampling, we sampled multiple individuals of each species. So I think as a, as a composite, I think it was, it's probably pretty close, but you're right. I mean, the feeding itself could, could have some impact on what, what our response was. Yeah. Um, just thinking back to the quote you had from the 30s where the researcher was saying that they didn't notice a big impact of grasshoppers on the ecosystem. Like, I know it's always disappointing to get like non-significant results, yeah. but it's actually maybe kind of like a cool result. Mm -hmm. I guess when I think grasshoppers, I think like biblical locusts, like <laughs> de decimation yeah. of plants. So mm -hmm. do you, I, I know you said there's some limitations to like the study, but do you think that actually maybe is a cool actual finding that the impacts mm -hmm. are humongous? That, and that's actually one of the findings we'd like to promote more because um, grasshopper management has historically been to spray them with chemicals on large scales. Um, but what we're, we're seeing is that if you can, man there are ways to manage through grazing and in some systems fire, so some other systems where they've looked at fire responses, fire plays a little bit more important role. Um, but if you can manage for high diversity prairie through grazing and fire, you can really eliminate or reduce the need for chemical control. Yeah. How many grasshoppers per cage do you think In this particular study, I think we ended up, well, uh, actually, um, it, it varied. So with this particular study, what we did was we varied the number of grasshoppers by species because some of the species were really little, some of them were really big. So we tried to make sure that grasshopper biomass was consistent across all cages. So the small bodied species, I think there were up to 17 individuals per cage. The larger bodied species, like four or five individuals. Good question. Mark? So if you saw a change in um, litter quality or uh, vegetation nutrient quality in a six-week experiment that was related to insect or hopper biodiversity, wouldn't that imply that a loss of grasshopper biodiversity could have pretty profound effects on nutrient cycling and all mm -hmm. kinds of other things? Yeah, I mean, I guess that's a good way of looking at it is because we, you know, it was such a short experiment and we did see some impacts um, that in itself would be meaningful, yeah. And there is Michael Strickland's lab at University of Idaho. We also collected a lot of um, soil quality, soil microbial composition, and he's working on all of that data um, associated with this experiment as well. So has anybody okay. ever looked at that on a longer time span, the relationship between um, grasshopper biodiversity and not biodiversity. So there's um, been a lot of work in Montana where so grasshoppers also will have um, sort of interesting preferences that, in, that kind of align with uh, decomposition rates. So they will some in some sites they will preferentially feed on species that decompose more quickly than others and in some sites they'll preferentially feed on species that decompose more slowly. And so there's been some work over, um, you know, like 15, 20 year time spans. And yeah, they see some pretty significant impacts on nitrogen cycling, decomposition rates. Um, but it's more related to, you know, sites, the, that preference for material based on how it, its decomposition works. Oh, I think there's a lot more to figure, <laughs> to figure out. You know, and like I was saying with Megan is, um, you know, I think one of the, the, well, there's several things that we need to look at. One, I would like to replicate this experiment at multiple sites. Mm -hmm. The other thing is a lot of um, biodiversity ecosystem function um, projects with plants have a much larger pool of species to work with. Mm -hmm. So they might be looking, you know, from zero to 60 plant species and five functional groups, where with grasshoppers, it's a much smaller range. Um, so it might be a little bit harder to tease apart those, you know, if you're only looking at zero, one or two species functional groups, to pick up a difference there might be a little bit more difficult. 
So I would think there are forb, feeder, forb feeding species that exclusively feed on forbs, and so I think including those so that we would at least have three functional groups, include more species so we have a larger species pool to consider. I think that'd be important. Yeah. yeah. Is there concern about um, climate change impacts on grasshoppers? Because you're saying, I don't know anything about insects. I can't remember. <laughs> There's something about they needed cold winters. Right. So a lot of the mixed feeding species, um, at least, need to go, they need to have really cold temperatures to go into diapause. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, and they're also very sensitive in the early part of their egg stage, they're very sensitive to soil moisture. So yeah, so with climate change impacts especially, you know, in a lot of sites we see one of the biggest climate change, or you know, over time the big change shift is in minimum temperatures. So as minimum temperature, you know, as temperature doesn't get as low, um, it may actually, well, I mean, it'll likely shift community composition, but especially with those mixed feeders, we're likely to see them kind of just naturally decline to a certain extent, or they shift their okay, range. It's only the mixed feeders, though, that have that. Well, some of the other species, but the mixed, I guess the mixed feeders are often the ones that um, swarm and migrate, so a lot of times they're the ones that we pay a lot of attention to. So it may just be that those are the ones we know the best in terms of their requirements. Yeah. Ryan? Um, are there any theories about evolutionarily why they're so inefficient? <laughs> <laughs> they don't have hands. <laughs> they don't have thumbs. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And they, I haven't seen anything. Yeah, um, just kind of like sever the leaf? The yeah. Leaf. Well, in part of that, part of the the answer is probably that they sample. Like they have um, little palps outside their mandibles, so they can palpate. And they, that gives them some information on quality. And then if that, you know, if they palpate it, oh yeah, this seems like it would be good, they'll sample it a little bit. So they might take a few little bites and then decide whether they're gonna actually make a full meal there or if they're gonna go somewhere else. And so part of the inefficiency may be that sampling is that they sever just enough um, to you know, cause, cause the tissue to separate from the plant. So that may be part of it. Yeah, Mark. Any ideas as to why grazing by bison at Kansa Prairie results in more insect biodiversity or grasshopper biodiversity? <laughs> Probably because of the effect of bison on plant diversity. So um, bison grazing tends to increase the forb component, um, whereas the sites, at least at Kansa, the sites that are not grazed by bison tend to be just a sea of big blue stem and in Indian grass. Um, very few forbs, whereas the bison grazing, you ha well, and the other thing about the bison grazing that's important for grasshoppers is they need structural complexity. So they need to have food, but they also need to have like soil where they can sit and absorb heat from the sun and um, oviposit, so then they need bare ground in order to lay their eggs. And so the bison pastures give them that structural complexity, it gives them um, botanic diversity, you know, diversity, and so I think it's just a much more heterogeneous um, landscape. Do you know if the waste produced by grasshoppers <laughs> in plays an important role in the ecosystem? That's an excellent question. I spent one whole summer picking grasshopper frass <laughs> to, to ask that question. And um, it's it, other people have tried to look at it too, and it's it's a it's hard to pick up a signal of it. I mean, everyone kind of assumes it has to um, because it's, they poop a lot. Um, but yeah, we couldn't, we couldn't detect any effect of it and I know a lot of other people have tried and, and failed. Yep. Has anyone tried to use grass peppers to maybe change the trajectory of an ecosystem? You said they were doing a lot of work in Montana, mm -hmm. and I think they have large areas that used to be dominated by grasses that are now dominated by forbs, like yellow star thistle. Oh, yeah. Seems like if they had a bunch of mixed feeders. That could, yeah, you know, I don't know, I can't think of, can't think of anyone having done that. Most, most, of, the, most of the management type folks are more interested in killing them than anything. What are other ways that people research impacts of grasshoppers? Like, 
caged studies, can you do large scale exposures and enclosures? It seems like it'd be so hard with little. Yeah, ones. there's um, the the other. Well, besides doing like mesocosm experiments in the, the greenhouse, you know, where you kind of artificially make a a plant community and add grasshoppers. Um, that's one thing. In the field, some people have tried doing um, like pesticide applica insecticide applications to eliminate, but the problem with that is you're not just eliminating, like the, the goal is just to eliminate grasshoppers, but you end up eliminating all insects. And you have to reapply it really frequently to have any measurable impact because they get they recolonize so quickly, um, so it's mostly by doing um, cage cage studies. Let's give her another round of thanks.